Hi everyone. Welcome to another fertility Q&A series with the expert. And our expert today is Dr. Ji Dang. She did an awesome job talking to us about the risks of IVF. If you haven't watched that show, you should definitely be tuning into it. It's a very, very thorough analysis of the risks of IVF. And here she is. I'm so excited to have her on right now. Her have pages and pages and questions. You guys did a great job sending them in. I'm so excited to accept that. Uh, Excited, I can barely talk. Hi, G, how are you? Uh, hi, you. Dr. Amy, how here. are you? I'm doing great. So for our audience, can you just tell us about your practice, tell us a little bit about you, and then we're gonna go right into our questions. Okay, all right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. G Den. I'm a reproductive endocrinology and infertility fellow at Stanford. Um, I had my medical degrees in China. Um, I was fully trained as a fertility uh, specialist and practiced for a couple of years in China before I came to the U.S. And after I came to the U.S., I had additional training. I completed my OBGYN residency. And afterwards, I went to Yale. Um, I had my maternal field medicine um, fellowship and worked as a attending at Yale for a couple of years. I came to Stanford two years ago, and now here I am. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's so great to have you here. We're so lucky to have you in the Bay Area, and I can't wait for all the amazing things that you're going to do to improve Thank you. women's health and especially fertility. Okay, here we go. I'm going to start asking you questions. Hello, doctors. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for doing this today. They're so helpful. My question is this. I have PCOS, but definitely ovulate. My follicular phase is just very long, sometimes up to 25 days. Every month without question, I get sore breasts seven days before my period like clockwork, and I have trouble sleeping before my period arrives. Would this also happen once I'm pregnant? I feel like this month, it, or I should say, I, sh I feel like each month this happens and I just count myself out for that month. I'm 32, trying to conceive for a few years with one miscarriage and one chemical pregnancy. I've thought about IVF, but I'm terrified of all the risks meds, shots, side effects, and surgery. What advice do you have? Okay. All right. So there's, uh, there are several questions. Um, but like, first of all, for the breast, like a uh, tenderness, it's not uncommon for women to have some premenstrual uh, breast, like swelling and tenderness. Uh, sometimes um, it can happen during early pregnancy, especially in the first trimester. But most of people, their symptoms can uh, improve over time. And I would say um, if your like, tenderness is like, uh, um, significantly impact your uh, quality of life, you probably want to be checked like, with your OBGYN doctor. Just make sure there's no like, lump or any like, fibrocystic disease of your breast that can cause significant pain. Otherwise, use some like, a supportive bra uh, or use some like, ice pack or warm uh, compressors, whatever you feel like it's going to help you. Um, and uh, um, in terms of your PCOS, um, sounds like uh, you had two, like one miscarriage and one uh, biochemical. I would say um, if you have been trying to get pregnant for a couple of years, it doesn't hurt to go and see a fertility specialist. Seeing a specialist, a doctor, doesn't mean that you need to jump into the IVF right away. Um, but it's always good uh, to make sure you don't have any other etiology. For example, any like uterine factors can potentially cause uh, pregnancy loss. So that's what I would recommend. Absolutely. Get a full workup, see what's going on. Just because yeah. you see one of us doesn't mean you have to jump. <laughs> exactly. We're not, we're not going to force you to do IVF. We're just going to teach you about your body. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. here's uh -huh. another question, also PCOS related. I'm 31 mm -hmm. years old, trying to conceive for two years. I have mild PCOS, a high follicle count and longer periods, anywhere from 31 to 41 days. I'm terrified of having a miscarriage because I already had a miscarriage that unfortunately was genetically, it was a genetic abnormality of the pregnancy at 14 weeks that I had to terminate. Do you have any advice for me? Um, first of all, I'm so sorry that like for your pregnancy loss. Um, for... Um, uh, the PCOS, um, I think one good thing about PCOS is you have a good number of follicles. Mm -hmm. um, the most important uh, determining factor for fertility is a woman's age. So um, if you're age like 32, right? It's like a how old right. are she was, uh, she, this, she's this, um, this person asking this question is 31 years old. Oh, okay. So I would say at uh, 31, um, age 31, your chance to have a, like a normal, genetically normal, when we say genetic, we mean like chromosome, like a number is normal, like X is probably about like 80%. Mm -hmm. So you do have a good chance to get pregnant uh, and have a natural uh, pregnancy. 
um, understand that your miscarriage at 14 weeks is, uh, was absolutely like a traumatic for you, but depends on what's the cause, especially if you had like a genetically abnormal embryos, um, then I think that explained why you had a miscarriage. But as I said, based on your age in your next pregnancy, you still have a good chance to get yes. a normal. Normal. I agree. So someone's asking live here, but what about if she was 42 years old and not 31? What advice that's, would you have? That's a, like a very good question. Yeah. So at, like at age 42, so the chance to have abnormal eggs is probably as high as 80%. Right. So, so that's a reason. And most of these like abnormal eggs would not end up with pregnancy. And even if you get pregnant with these abnormal eggs, there's a high chance that you might go to miscarriage. That's the reason as we, like women, get older, then uh, it's hard to get pregnant and easy to have miscarriage. So I would say um, um, at age 42, if you can get pregnant naturally, that's the best thing for you. You can still try, uh, although the chance of having miscarriage is high. But if you say, I truly want to do everything I can to avoid a miscarriage, then potentially the pre-implantation genetic testing, that's a technology that can help you. But you have to go through the IVF though. Uh, that's, uh, yeah. Okay, here's another question. I'm 35, almost 36 years old. I've been trying to get pregnant for six months now. I have regular mm -hmm. periods. What should my next steps be? Should I go to my fertility doc or a fertility doctor? Should I go to my gynecologist? At what point should I do IUI? How long does it take before I'm even able to do an IUI if I decide today? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Um, actually, so there's a recommendation from American Society of uh, Reproductive Medicine. If you're age 35 uh, or like uh, beyond age 35, if you have been trying to get pregnant for six months and uh, uh, hasn't been successfully, uh, I mean, get pregnant, then we recommend that you go and see a fertility specialist to get evaluation and assessment. Um, and uh, uh, the next question is, oh, so like about IUI? Okay. Yeah, so, about so, IUI. At what point sure. should I consider IUI? And if I decide today, how long will it take until I can get my first IUI too? Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, when you go to see a fertility doctor, usually they will uh, do several evaluations, including your ovarian reserve, mm -hmm. your following tube, and a semen analysis. And based on these results, then uh, you will go to like a several, you have several um, treatment options. IUI is usually offered to patients who has open tubes, first of all, and with normal semen um, uh, parameters. Mm -hmm. And uh, if uh, you, uh, everything looks normal, I think IUI is the most probably cost effective way to start with. And it depends on which day are you in uh, your cycle when you see the fertility doctor. Typically, IUI, we start to um, uh, give several like uh, pills uh, mm -hmm. starting on your cycle day three to day five. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you take for five days. We then ask you to come back to monitor your follicle size. If you happen to be at the beginning of your cycle, you can, you're ready to go. If uh, like uh, um, you already like passed your uh, ovulation uh, in this cycle, then you have to wait until your next menses. Right. Okay. Here's another question being asked live. I have one question that I ask Dr. Amy every month. <laughs> What's the natural <laughs> chance of pregnancy for a 45 year old? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, depends on uh, if you're planning to use your own eggs or uh, if you plan to use a donor egg. I would say for most women who's age 45, the chance to get pregnant um, by using their own egg is probably in the single digits. We never say zero, but like uh, it's uh, definitely less than 10 percent, probably less than 5 percent. Uh, but we do see women uh, get pregnant by using their own eggs at age 45. It's just that, that chance is, uh, um, is low. Right. Uh, by using donor eggs, then that's a completely different story. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good answer. Okay. <laughs> Here's the next question. You do the best Q&As. This time I'd like to ask this. I did my first IUI. I used letrozole, 2.5 milligrams, only one follicle grew. I triggered on day 23 of the cycle, and I had an IUI on day 25. Are my chances super low because there was only one follicle? I'm on day eight trying, you know, in the two-week wait, and my doctor used 10,000 units of Novarol sub-Q. Any idea why Novarol when my other friends use Ovidrol? Okay. All right. Um, so um, these are, like, a great mm -hmm. questions, first of all. Um, 
typically um, the successful rate of uh, IUI cycle, we, was, we say like each cycle uh, is about 10%. There are several other factors can affect your chance. For example, women's age, uh, your, uh, how many follicles do you have and what's the endometrial lining thickness. Yes, having two or three follicles will definitely give you a higher chance compared with having only one follicle, but doesn't mean that you cannot get pregnant with one follicle. Theoretically, you only need one normal right. <laughs> to right. get pregnant. Right. Uh, uh, hopefully, this cycle will work, but if it doesn't, then I think like uh, your doctor can uh, increase the letrozole dose. Uh, for example, give you five milligram a day for five days in your next cycle. And uh, uh, what, I'm sorry, what's the next question? I know, Shanda? we're getting so many questions. <laughs> the other part of the question is the difference between Novarol and Omicron. Oh, okay, okay. So um, there are two uh, technology uh, platforms to produce HCG. Both of these mm -hmm. medications are HCG. In terms of the uh, effect or efficacy to induce ovulation and egg maturation, they are the same. I don't okay. see the difference. Uh, it's just a one uh, was produced from postmenopausal women's urine, and uh, um, uh, Avidro was produced by a genetic uh, recombinant technology. Um, I think uh, doctors has, uh, have their own preference to use one medication versus the other. Sometimes in your insurance um, policy might um, uh, like determine like which one they cover, which one they uh, don't. So, uh, right. but uh, they're pretty much the same. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Hello, doctors. Thank you for the good work that you do. I want to ask Dr. G, which method of FET does she prefer, natural or medicated, and why? Okay. This is a really good question. Um, uh, so first of all, uh, for people who does not have a regular menses, which means if they don't like uh, ovulate spontaneously, then they are a good candidate for a medicated cycle. Mm -hmm. If a woman has um, a regular cycle, uh, which um, like uh, indicates that like she has a spontaneous ovulation, then she can go either way. Um, so natural cycle FET, you need to come back to the clinic more often um, because we need to monitor your follicle size. Um, and also you might get like a several times of blood drawn to check your hormone levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, for medicated cycle, uh, you just start the estrogen from the beginning of your cycle for uh, 12 or 14 days. And then we check your th lining thickness. If it's good enough, then we add the progesterone. So, um, Medicated cycle definitely is uh, easier to control and uh, more convenient for doctors and uh, uh, patients. So that's the reason many IVF centers and the doctors, they prefer uh, medicated cycle. In terms of the uh, outcome, actually these two modalities, they have similar or like a comparable life birth rate. So um, uh, we don't, there's no recommendation uh, as, um, like support one versus the other. Uh, so I think like uh, both of them are okay. Uh, yeah. It just depends on your situation. So the same person asked, also, I had one failed FET with a genetically normal embryo, and I previously wanted to do the ERA test for my next transfer, but now I've changed my mind. Now I want to do an FET using a natural cycle without the ERA. What do you mm -hmm. think about that? Okay, so I think if you had, sounds like you probably had a medicated psycho with right. your first transfer. Right. Right. Uh, if you uh, failed that transfer, you want to try a natural psycho, you have like a regular menses, I think it's completely okay to try different things. Uh, ERA, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. And also the data for ERA, um, um, like uh, original data for ERA, ERA actually came from medicated cycle as well. Mm -hmm. So now uh, some doctors are doing ERA for natural cycle, but mm -hmm. no matter what, if you decide to go back to do ERA you, in your real embryo transfer cycle, you want to have the exact protocol as what you had with your ERA. Uh, ERA. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, uh -huh. another question. Also, a friend had a successful transfer with genetically normal embryos. She did the blood test that comes with an anatomical scan, and they said that she's high risk for trisomy 18. Should she be worried? She's 36 years old. So a genetically normal embryo, then did the NIPT with positive for trisomy 18. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, your friend uh, must be super stressed by this like yes. a result. Uh, yes. um, but uh, you know, like a pre-implantation genetic testing, I think the false negative rate uh, based on data is uh, very low. It's not uh, zero, but I think it's about 1% around-ish. 
correct me, Dr. Amy. I agree. Right. Yeah, yeah, I probably uh, see one false. Po- yeah, I mean, yes, you're right. I agree. Uh, probably around that, um, yeah. less than 5%, I would right. say. Uh, so for NIPT, there is a, like, um, NIPT is very good if you get a negative result, which means like if uh, uh, you get negative um, pre like a non-invasive pre-implant, uh, prenatal diagnosis, then the chance you have abnormal fetus is low. However, right. NIPT has false positive rate. Right. Um, so I would say trisomy 18. Um, if uh, she goes to the ultrasound, I think anatomy scan is important. If it's right. a real trisomy 18 baby, you would definitely see uh, some congenital anomalies. Mm-hmm. And I think amniocentesis will be recommended to mm-hmm. confirm the diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Totally. And what I do sometimes is I use a different company for the NIPT and a week later I get a result and it's normal. And I say, Uh, yeah, yeah, we have the the technology has uh, its limitations. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Okay. Here's Mm -hmm. another question. Can you talk about HGH or human derived growth hormone in detail and the role for improving eggs and sperm quality and what dose do you usually generally recommend? Okay. So uh, growth hormone is produced by the pituitary, basically our brain. Uh, there's uh, growth hormone, um, um, like a receptors on the ovary uh, around the follicles. So um, growth hormone has been used uh, or has been shown to improve the follicle uh, development in mouse model, in animal models. Yeah. In human being, that data is a little bit mixed. Um, but there uh, like a data there show like using growth hormone can, especially in uh, poor ovarian response uh, women, it can help and uh, uh, decrease the duration of stimulation, uh, lower the uh, medication dosage, and increase the number of follicles or eggs. And uh, uh, some reports say it in, uh, improved the life birth rate. Some uh, say um, like there's no significant difference. So I think the data is still debatable. Uh, but for uh, poor ovarian response patients, sometimes I feel as a physician, the treatment options we can offer to the patient um, are limited. Right. And if a patient is willing to try, um, this medication is safe. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's uh, not, um, it's a little bit expensive, but mm-hmm. I think uh, it's worth to, to try if you're willing to do it. Right. Uh, it can potentially can help you. Uh, yeah. I bet there's something in our DNA, it's like a c- certain genotype that it helps, because I certainly find it helps some patients, and it's phenomenal. True, very and in other true. patients, it doesn't. And I just wish that I knew what the differences were, because then if, if that person, I knew it wouldn't help them, then they wouldn't have to spend all that extra money on the drug. I 100% you know? agree with you. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Here we go. What is your favorite prenatal vitamin? Oh, Okay. Um, you know, I don't have a like specific brand. Uh, mm-hmm. When I was looking for prenatal vitamins, I checked for uh, several like a key nutrients, which is important, uh, which are important for reproductive health. Mm-hmm. For example, folic acid, iron, uh, vitamin D, uh, calcium, iodine, uh, DHA. Uh, mm-hmm. Those are things I want to see on the label. And uh, um, for the uh, folic acid, you want to see like a, a 400 to 600 uh, microgram. Um, like a, you want to take those like in a day. Um, and uh, uh, vitamin D, uh, I think a recommended dose is 600 international units a day. Most prenatal vitamins, they contain uh, 400 my, uh, international units. You can make up that difference by drinking uh, milk with uh, fortified uh, vitamin D. Perfect. Uh, and what yeah. about the right amount of fish oil or DHA? Fish oil, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, fish oil basically contain as, um, uh, DHA and uh, EPA. Right. So recommended dose for uh, DHA is uh, 300 milligram per day. Mm-hmm. So uh, when you go and buy the fish oil, sometimes they show like 500 milligram or like a thousand milligram uh, per um, capsule. It doesn't mean that they contain the same amount of uh, DHA plus EPA. So you want to check uh, on the label to see what's the exact amount of those like uh, uh, true bioactive um, ingredients right. they have. Mm-hmm. But there's a live question that just came up and it was very similar to one recent previous question. So I want to ask uh, it to you now. Is a false positive for trisomy 21 common for the state test? Okay. So I think that's the triple marker test, you know, the um, serum screen, the quad screen. 
You know, okay. what I'm you know what I'm saying? Sure, sure. And, and can the anatomy scan detect or confirm the three most common trisomies? That's the question. That's actually an excellent question. So I think a false positive uh, rate of uh, NIPT depends on maternal age uh, a lot of time. And also, um, uh, for example, if a woman is young, then uh, the, she gets like a positive um, a trisomy 21, then the chance to have a real one is uh, relatively uh, lower. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also depends on anatomy skin. Uh, if there's any congenital anomaly appreciated on the ultrasound, definitely that increases the risk of a real, um, like a chromosome of normal baby. Uh, for Down uh, syndrome, trisomy 21 specifically, there's some percentage of a fetus will show completely normal on ultrasound. Mm -hmm. But if the ultrasound is normal, uh, then the chance to have a real Down syndrome baby actually dropped significantly um, to, um, like a, to only like a, a 15 to 20%, Perfect. I think. So I have mm -hmm. a live question here. At what stage, this is related to um, acne medication and IVF, at what stage, and this is Dr. Heidi Godarzi, she's a, a dermatologist in Newport Beach. At what stage of IVF do women have to stop their acne medication? 30 days before retrieval, good. We stop 30 days before they try in natural pregnancy. And I think what she's talking about is like spironolactone, for example. What do you tell your patients? Uh, I would definitely say, uh, well, I think like I would recommend probably the same, like one month before yeah. the retrieval. Um, um, because like a, um, basically the organ formation critical stage is mm -hmm. like a before um, like a, uh, 18 weeks, but yeah. like early, uh, sometimes the organ development like early as like five weeks is or so, uh, like a critical stage. So I would. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's an IVF question. I ended up with a day three single embryo. It was four cells, grade A, slow growing. The doctor was very pessimistic. Are you also pessimistic? What do you think? That's the question. <laughs> okay, so I think on day three, most uh, good potential embryos will have six to eight cells. Uh, but it doesn't mean that a four cell embryo will not make you uh, pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I do see uh, women get pregnant with, after transferring um, one day three, uh, four cell embryos. Uh, yes, so a day, um, a eight cell embryo has better potential than a four cell embryo, but um, um, it's, um, the, the chance to get pregnant with a four cell embryo is lower, but it's not a rare, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, it's a probably roughly around like a six to 8%, um, mm. depends on which data you look for. But you know what, you never know, there's always yeah. hope. Uh, yeah. So I would say I'm crossing f my fingers for you and hope for the best. My fingers, toes and nose. And that makes people <laughs> wonder like, how do you cross your nose? I have, I have a big nose, so it has a, takes on a personality of its own. Okay, here's another question. What is the ideal AMH level for a successful IVF cycle? And thank you so much. Okay. Uh, AMH is produced by small follicles on the ovary. Uh, AMH level can tell you, um, can let's say, can predict like uh, what's your response will be during the IVF treatment, how many follicle or eggs you can get. But it does not tell you uh, what's your um, uh, egg quality because the most important factor is still maternal age. So I would say if you have a good, uh, have a normal AMH level, uh, one to four, that's good. But if you have a low AMH level, less than one, it doesn't mean that you cannot get pregnant. A young woman with a uh, low AMH still, have, um, still has a fair good um, chance uh, to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I would never say like, a, uh, you cannot, I mean, AMH level should right. not like a limit. Um, right. Uh, yeah. You're not. You're not a number. You're not your AMA. Exactly. So what drives me crazy is that there's so much messaging that's just not right out there. Let's say a 35 year old with an AMA of 0.2, and then she thinks she has the eggs of a 45 year old, and she's mm -hmm. been told that, and it's just not true. She yeah, still has true. a chance for pregnancy. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I have a very long question, but before I get to that one, I'm going to read this one here. I'm 26 years old, and I was admitted in the hospital four years ago for PID. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's pelvic inflammatory disease. Can I still have babies? What does this mean? What should I do? How do I fix it? If I can't have babies, please help me. Give me some advice. Okay. Uh, so um, 
uh, I think like um, um, you like brought up like a very um, uh, good questions and your concern is very reasonable. First of all, uh, PID is associated with uh, some tubal factor infertility um, because inflammation sometimes can cause adhesions in the pelvis. Um, and also it's associated with higher chance of ectopic pregnancy. But I would say if you haven't uh, been trying to get pregnant or if you don't uh, plan to get pregnant right now, uh, you don't have to be uh, uh, like worrying too much. That's what I say. Uh, overall, the chance to have infertility after one episode of PID is roughly about 6 or 7%. It's mm -hmm. higher than general population, but it doesn't mean that you cannot get pregnant naturally. After you mean one. I can't scare young people uh, out of, yeah. like, just you can't do that and have unprotected <laughs> sex or else you'll never be able to get, I can't do that anymore? It's only 6 to 7%? Okay, fine. I will stop. Okay. Well, I, I mean, it's always good to, like, it to, as what she said, have protected <laughs> sex, but I mean, like, with I'm one the reality is you shouldn't be that worried about it. Exactly. Still, yeah. yeah. But uh, if you get pregnant, you want to go to your doctor as early as possible to just make sure that the pregnancy is located in the normal uh, mm -hmm. location. And uh, if you tried actively tried to get pregnant for six or eight or 12 months, you still cannot get pregnant, then it's very reasonable to get your tubal uh, checked. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I agree. Your tubes. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a long question, and there's several parts to it that it was emailed to me for mm -hmm. this live Q&A. So I'm going to start reading it. Hi, thank you for doing this. You guys are awesome. I've been watching you and find the Q&A is very helpful. So thank you. I'm 36 and I've recently been told that my AMH is now 0.7. It was 0.9 one year ago. My partner's 28 years old. Go team, you're 36, he's 28. We love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and his sperm test revealed three out of four normal numbers. Volume, concentration, motility, all really good. The morphology was 0%. We'll be repeating his sperm test in two weeks. He drinks four cups per day of coffee. He's going to cut back and entirely on alcohol in case that helps. We would like to have two children, but we're now concerned that we may not even be able to have one. My fertility doctor said this. They told me, are you ready for this? <laughs> Poor mm -hmm. woman. That I have the numbers that are above a woman who is 36 years old. That I have the numbers of a 40-year-old woman. Does that sound correct? That's part one of the question. Well, I never told my patients, say, hey, with your AMH level, your egg or like your ovarian age is like a, uh, the same as like age like 42 or like, right. I never told them that. Uh, the AMH level can only tell you uh, tell you like how many follicles you have, but mm -hmm. never be able to tell you like your egg quality. Your mm -hmm. age is still most important factor. I'm so mm -hmm. sorry that like you're having so much stress from the, like these numbers, but I would say uh, with the AMH level 0 0.7 uh, mm -hmm. at age 36, you still have a uh, fair uh, chance to get pregnant. Um, okay. um, and it um, um, sounds like you're um, doing whatever you can. You're taking supplements and uh, um, your partners are uh, doing some like a lifestyle change and uh, you're actively like seeking fertility care. You're on the right track. Uh -huh. in yeah, in terms of the semen, um, I think like um, sounds like all the parameters are normal except the morphology. Mm -hmm. uh, morphology actually is a poor parameter to predict uh, whether uh, a man is fertile or infertile, um, especially if it's an isolated finding. I think it's very wise for him to repeat the semen analysis in two weeks. If uh, the repeated semen uh, parameter still shows uh, like a 0% morphology, and I think he might want to be seen by a urologist just to want to make sure there's no medical reasons that can impact uh, the semen quality. For example, uh, uh, varicocele is like a very uh, common reason that can actively impact the semen quality. But I think you guys are uh, truly like doing whatever you can uh, to try to improve um, your chance. Um, I'm, uh, I'm holding uh, hopes on you guys and I think like uh, um, uh, you're on the right track. Awesome. Yeah, I agree mm -hmm. with that. You know how I designed the tushy method, right? And I don't know yeah. if you know, I also have the balls method for men. <laughs> balls is background genetics, anatomy, lifestyle, labs, and sex. So look at ballsmethod.com. Yeah. Balls okay, 
So that's I, I it take for your, all. I take your course, Lenny, <laughs> to learn this. <laughs> Thank you. So that's it for the questions that were sent to us. So now are you ready for the questions that have been chatted here live? Yeah, sure. Okay. Let's okay. Do Someone it. said, ha ha, I was told my AMH, FSH, AFC was that of a 49-year-old. Well, I'm sorry you were told that. That's very mean. Not that, I mean, I'm almost 49, so I don't find that mean. That's what I mean. Okay. But you know what I mean. Okay. I had my first follicle scan today on IVF treatment day six. I have 28 follicles and they're all between five to 11 millimeters in size. Okay. Treatment day six, 28 follicles, five to 11 millimeters. Should I be worried about the big difference in the size five to 11 on treatment day six? Well, uh, so are we talking about the same like a person who was told same, that like, no this is a new person no oh, no this is person. a totally so new sorry. person no no okay. no no this is I'm rapid so fire no no you're doing great okay so, this gotcha. is a new question so yeah. on the psycho treatment cycle day five you had like a um, follicle number five or six five, five or six, six. very yeah. from like a five to 11 millimeter and Actually, 28 uh, follicles 28, 28 of Okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. first of all, I think it's a good thing that you have so many follicles. Um, um, the uh, size varying between 5 to 11 or 12 millimeter actually is very common. Uh, although we're giving the medication try to support the whole cohort of follicles, the, these follicles do not like uh, uh, grow at exactly the same pace. Mm -hmm. um, but it uh, uh, sounds like you have a very good number. Um, I feel like it uh, uh, sounds like you're responding to the medication and the treatment pretty well. As Thank long you. as like a majority of your follicles are growing uh, always a similar pace, I think you're going to have a, a good uh, like prognosis. It. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Okay, here's another question. Does method of priming for IVF and duration help if I'm 40 with a low AMH and poor ovarian response history? And I'm priming with Agestin, and considering priming with birth control pills. Will either one of those priming methods help me? Okay. So I think um, uh, was like a priming, uh, priming with birth control sometimes for some women can um, suppress endogenous FSH level. Uh, and depends on how many days you're going to use them. Uh, mm -hmm. If you use them like uh, 12 to two weeks, uh, some people might not uh, show like um, get like a, so much suppression, mm -hmm. but if you use that for like a, a long time, like three weeks or more, then I think it definitely it will negatively impact your response. Yeah. And uh, um, um, uh, depends on your um, like a doctor's protocol they plan to use. I think it's good to bring up this question and just uh, like uh, talk to your physician about mm -hmm. to say, hey, uh, I'm concerning about this birth control uh, pill use. Uh, right. do you think like a, uh, should I um, try something different or not I need a t-shirt or a bumper sticker that says I hate birth control pills because they're disgusting <laughs> to me I'm just kidding but they confuse people because like we want to get pregnant and they're told to be on birth control they should be called fertility planning For, SPPs right SPP. fertility I love planning that. pills like True. we're not yeah. talking about birth control but I agree mm -hmm. I think they can suck especially if you're 40 or more with a low egg count they can certainly suppress yeah. but some clinics need to use it because they just have to for mm -hmm. planning purposes exactly okay here's another question are the success rates different as far as live birth between fresh and frozen transfers okay uh, that's a like a very good question so uh, I think it depends on patients uh, situation um, we do. We are not doing many fresh transferring nowadays um, because many uh, women are choosing to have a pre-implantation genetic testing that request of uh, freezing all the embryos. Mm -hmm. For fresh transfer, uh, we look up several things. First of all, uh, what's the estrogen level? Uh, if estrogen level is too high, for example, more than three thousand, then that will definitely negatively impact your chance of pregnancy. And also, we look at your uh, uh, we look um, at your, um, sorry, I, oh, we also check your progesterone level right. on the day of uh, trigger. If mm -hmm. your progesterone level is higher, for example, higher than 1.5, mm -hmm. then that means uh, your uh, endometrium receptive window might close sooner. Right. So uh, in that case, we would not uh, transfer the, um, like a fresh embryo. Right. Uh, but overall, I think there's a data suggesting that like, uh, a frozen embryo transfer has a, a higher life birth rate um, mm -hmm. than the fresh embryo transfer in some specific population. 
Right. I mean, I remember yeah. when we started doing more frozens and I had to talk to people that frozens are, are it might be better. And then mm -hmm. it's funny how trends change and people ask these questions all over again. So here's another question. I was 34 years old at the time of my egg retrieval, 34. Okay. My history is ruptured ectopic, decreased ovarian reserve and endometriosis. Only one embryo out of five made it to freeze on day six and it was graded four BB. Okay, so a 34-year-old with one 4BB embryo, ruptured ectopic, DOR, endometriosis. What is the percentage rate that that embryo will have normal chromosomes? What would you okay. predict? Uh, at age 34, I would okay. say it's probably roughly around 40% uh, um, uh, will be genetically abnormal, which mm -hmm. means like 60%, uh, uh, 50 to 60% will be genetically normal. Cool. That's what I would uh, predict. Like, uh, yeah, predict. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. here we go. I have a whole bunch of other questions right here, and people are commenting um, that <laughs> just really cute comments, which are great. Okay, um, mm -hmm. let me go here. Okay, would you include Femera while doing a natural frozen embryo transfer? I'm sorry, include what? Femera or Letrozole. Oh, Letrozole during the natural, natural cycle? Natural cycle, yeah. Uh, well, I think if uh, some people who has a PCOS and they don't want to use a medicated cycle, uh, then yeah, letrozole can definitely help to stimulate the follicle growth. Yeah. And uh, uh, there's some data actually show like letrozole can help to increase the life birth rate, mm -hmm. like a kind of a modified um, natural cycle. Personally, I am not using that much unless the patient is truly has like ovulatory dysfunction. I like a, a natural cycle. Uh, because really? I think if a follicle can grow naturally, uh, then um, we can go with that. Uh, and what about a trigger shot? Do you use a trigger shot even if you're not using letrozole when you're no, doing no. a natural uh, cycle? No, no. We use a trigger shot yeah. for everyone. Yeah. Uh, exactly. I think that can help, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here we go. I'm 35 years old. I have uterine didelphus. So that means having two cavities. And an embryo transfer is scheduled for the end of July. I just started acupuncture. Is there anything else I should do in addition to medication to prepare my uterine lining? What kind of advice do you have for someone with uterine didelphus planning a transfer? Okay. Uh, I think for uh, uterine didelphus, um, the decision to go to the transfer would depend on uh, what's the size of uh, each cavity. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to transfer the embryo to the, like, the cavity with um, like a large or a big volume. And uh, uh, um, also, like uh, your doctors probably want to evaluate uh, the endometrial lining thickness before your real embryo transfer. Um, right. you, uh, and I think a hysteroscopy to take a look at your, the urine cavity can definitely help as well. Uh, other than that, I think uh, just kind of a do um, uh, usually what we would recommend for every woman, um, uh, try to eat healthy, yeah. balanced uh, diet and uh, um, uh, limit the caffeine or like alcohol yeah. and uh, do um, like a moderate uh, amount of exercise. Right. Um, I think those things can help and take uh, supplements. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so now we have someone who's 45 asking about the chances that success, of success using donor eggs and whether fresh is or is better than frozen for someone who's 45 using donor egg? Uh, you mean like a fresh uh, egg versus right. like uh, the frozen, frozen egg. egg? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I would say, um, based on data, actually, like a frozen eggs in nowadays, especially with those like a fasting vitrification um, uh, technology, mm -hmm. uh, the the outcome of a frozen egg is actually very close and similar to the fresh egg. Um, uh, outcomes yeah. and um, um, it's just like a different um, should we decide using the frozen egg versus fresh egg uh, sometimes based on how many children do you want to have right. uh, because with one batch of a frozen uh, like eggs probably you'll get one or like a two I would yeah. say like a good embryos but if yeah. you're using a fresh donor yeah. typically uh, we're talking about we can get like a 20 or 30 eggs and then uh, those eggs can potentially produce more than two or three good embryos. So that's completely, uh, um, I think it depends on how many children do you want and what's the financial resources um, like you would like to um, uh, pay basically for those right. um, treatments. Exactly, for those options. Mm -hmm. So yeah. do you still have time? Because we have a whole bunch of other questions. I want to yeah. make sure we still have yeah. you probably. Okay, I've cool. been Let's keep this. going. Yeah. Okay, good, here we go. <laughs> this one's a good question for everyone to hear. And I, because of your background and experience, I love that this person asked this question. What are your recommendations 
around COVID for fertility and pregnant patients? Go. Okay. Uh, okay. Good question. So I think for the COVID so far, uh, the data did not show that um, the COVID viral infection can make a pregnant woman's health. Um, um, let's say, um, let me draft it in a different way. Okay. So first of all, uh, for most uh, respiratory viral infection, women, uh, um, pregnant women is actually a high risk population mm -hmm. uh, because uh, during the pregnancy, your immune system is trying to suppress uh, like, uh, those are like immune uh, reactions. And that can potentially uh, make your situation worse if you get infection. However, in the COVID-19 infection uh, pandemic, we did not see that um, uh, phenomenon. Um, we did not, uh, basically women who get infected, uh, no matter they're pregnant or non-pregnant, they kind of uh, have like a similar uh, chance of like a, a developing severity, um, like a severe situation. Um, and also COVID-19 did not uh, show that it can um, uh, infect the baby. Um, there's no uh, strong data to support the vertical transmission. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know, um, but um, like a majority of the data actually coming from those pregnant women who's in second or third trimester, which means the exposure of the virus is kind of short between the diagnosis up to the delivery. Um, but those uh, uh, viral testing from the uh, placenta, from the amniotic fluid, from the baby's like a nasal swab did not mm -hmm. suggest that there is a vertical transmission. Mm -hmm. um, but if you get infection in early pregnancy, for example, uh, like in before 12 weeks, we don't know whether this mm -hmm. COVID-19 infection can cause increased miscarriage or mm -hmm. can increase the chance of a congenital anomalies. I think data are like is still very limited. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those women who want to get pregnant in this period, period of time, I think uh, um, there's no guideline say that you should not uh, get pregnant. Mm -hmm. But one thing you should think about is uh, in case if there's any emergency happen, especially mm -hmm. like in first trimester, for example, if you had a miscarriage or ectopic pregnancy, do you have adequate uh, resources? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, for example, the hospital or your doctor who's taking care of you um, have adequate resources that can provide those like uh, emergent um, right. um, procedure or surgery right. for you. Right. Uh, I think those are like important thing you want to think about. Absolutely. Um, so plan your pregnancy, make sure your doctor is going to see you, especially if you're a high risk uh, exactly. patient. Exactly. Even mm -hmm. especially if you've had a history of ectopic, it would yeah. be important to reach out to your doctor sure. ahead of time. Okay, True. here's a bunch of questions. Do you recommend taking maca or royal jelly pills? And if you do, are they safe? Uh, I think like uh, um, those are like safe. I think like yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't see like uh, uh, the data showing that you sh uh, it's yeah. it's dangerous. I agree, and I I don't necessarily. Don't, I have a special sauce, but maca and royal jelly is not part of my special sauce. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I haven't been too impressed with how they work. Okay, we don't have progesterone pessaries in this country, but someone's asking. Is progesterone and oil better than pessaries? I mean, I wish we had pessaries here. Mm -hmm. They have them, I think, in Australia. Uh, it's one country where I know that they have them. But I would say that, you know, I, I don't have as much experience with pessaries. I don't know that you have. Have you used I don't. progesterone? No, no. no but it I would be awesome. It would be yeah. awesome if we did. So we mm -hmm. didn't have to do the shots every night. Okay. How about this question? Is weight loss during an FET prep a good or a bad thing? Okay, that's uh, like a really good question. Mm -hmm. I think like uh, uh, there have been, uh, first of all, the data is solid in terms of the uh, negative impact of uh, overweight or high BMI to the reproductive outcome, especially mm -hmm. like a lower life birth rate, lower IVF uh, successful rate and a higher chance of miscarriage. Mm -hmm. However, whether losing weight can improve the reproductive outcome or not is still debatable. Mm -hmm. I think recently there are large uh, sample, uh, like there are data coming from large sample that showing uh, uh, when those um, fertility, uh, when this woman um, undergoing fertility treatment, um, okay. they underwent a uh, very strict diet, uh, intensive uh, physical exercise, and uh, they actively uh, um, lose, trying to lose like 10% uh, of their body weight. Actually, those uh, treatments did not 
did not significantly mm -hmm. improve mm -hmm. the ultimate outcome, which is the live birth rate. Right. Um, so I would say during the um, FET cycle, I probably would not recommend a very aggressive, uh, uh, like uh, trying to like lose weight in that right. short uh, time frame. I probably would right. not recommend. Right. Yeah, I mean, and it's so hard to those hormones make you feel it's like a very, crazy person and they change I, how you see food and they make you want to yeah, mm -hmm. eat everything in sight. So those things just mess you up. And so to I tell patients, if you can maintain your weight while you're on these drugs, it's like you're losing weight. Okay, so Good how point. about this question? Point. Should point. lining should lining be a certain thickness for a fresh transfer to be more successful? What what kind, what's your goal lining for fresh transfers? I think like as long as it's like, a, well, ideally we want to look for something like beyond eight millimeter, but like mm -hmm. seven to eight millimeter is um, um, pretty good. Yeah. Um, and the less than seven, then uh, it's associated with lower chance of pregnancy. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, it depends on some women, uh, no matter what uh, medication you give to them, no matter how you try, their lining can just can get to like a seven but not to go beyond eight. I think right. as long as they can reach seven millimeter and if that's yeah. the best that they can get, I'm yeah. okay with a transfer. Yeah. yeah, I agree, I agree. Okay, here's another question. Is it normal to get cysts on your ovaries after an egg retrieval? And then is it safe to proceed in the next cycle with a frozen embryo transfer? Okay, uh, good question. It's actually very common to have a cyst like formed right after the retrieval cycle. Most mm -hmm. of them are just like um, we call corpus luteum cyst. Mm -hmm. It will go away spontaneously in one mm -hmm. month or two. And uh, uh, I don't think that will significantly uh, impact your uh, next FET cycle. But I think it's better to go to the medicated cycle if you mm -hmm. decide to uh, do the embryo transfer right after the retrieval, just because sometimes that cyst can into theory with your ultrasound monitoring uh, mm -hmm. if you want to try the natural cycle of okay. ET. Okay, here's another question. I have two PGS normal embryos, two. Should I transfer one or both? Okay, good question. <laughs> I think right now in our society, we all agree that we will transfer only one genetically normal embryo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The life birth rate, I mean, average is about 60 to 65%. Um, and uh, uh, transfer to a genetically normal embryo uh, would just like significantly increase your uh, chance of twins. I know many people want uh, twins, but like um, uh, as physician, we truly think like one healthy baby, healthy yeah. mom is out to medical. Yeah, right. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this person, uh, best is yet to come IVF. She just listed her supplements for us. For, I'm taking a prenatal folate, fish oil, DHA. CoQ10, calcium, magnesium, zinc combination. Is there anything else you can suggest that I should take? Is there anything else that you would tell her to, to take? That sounds pretty good to me. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would. I I agree with you. I would not yeah. take anything else. I think those yeah. are good, good yeah. enough. Okay. Can you use your own eggs with an AMH of 0.08? Point zero eight. Point zero eight. Yeah. Well, I think. Uh, if you have uh, um, like a follicle can grow, uh, definitely you can. Uh, I know some physicians will do natural cycle, uh, like a retrieval mm -hmm. for a woman who has like a diminished ovarian reserve and mm -hmm. uh, has only one follicle growing each cycle. You can mm -hmm. definitely use that. As I mentioned, age is uh, like a, eventually uh, the determining factor of your chance and fertility. If you're young with a low MH level, um, I think it's still worse to, to try. Yeah, great. So this is a good question. I'm curious to what you think. What do you think of reproductive immunology? Uh, okay, I think this is a gray zone. Uh, there's so uh, much uncertainty and unknown things in this field. Uh, I think like the data is also very uh, muddy. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it's just uh, uh, hard to do a good uh, dis uh, designed randomized controlled trial right. uh, with so much like confounding factors in the like uh, in infertility or fertility treatment. Right. Um, personally, I think if a patient does not have any immunological issues, for example, if they don't have like Hashimoto's, if they don't have loops, then I. Uh, do not offer them any medication mm -hmm. uh, like uh, uh, related to uh, immunology. Mm -hmm. I know some physicians, they provide medication or treatment uh, for those 
people who has uh, recurrent failed uh, implantation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the data is not uh, very solid. It doesn't mean right. that we should dismiss this treatment for sure, right. but I think right. ASRM does have a recommendation uh, um, like uh, to kind of uh, try to um, um, very precautiously, like when you counsel and offer these treatments. To right, patients. I agree. I'm with you. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm 35 years old, and I'm going to give you my fertility indicators, my AMH, FSH, and follicle count. And I want you to tell me which one's the best predictor of fertility, okay? Mm -hmm. AMH is 0.75, FSH is 9, and follicle count is 14. And how old is she? I'm sorry. 35. 35. 35. Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, 35 is the best uh, number I would pick. But yeah. uh, in terms of those three, I Good. think uh, like uh, your follicle counts, um, probably uh, I will go with that. And then, uh, you know, FSH can fluctuate significantly uh, during the cycle. Uh, same as the follicle counts as well. But, you know, like AMH level, if it's uh, like a 0 0.7, uh, um, but you have like, a, I would say follicle number like 14 is a little mm -hmm. bit higher than what, uh, what I would expect uh, right. with uh, MH level 0 0.7. Right. So I would say probably, you know, uh, repeat another ultrasound to see what your follicle count would be. Uh, right. But I think age actually is the most important thing to determine your fertility. Brilliant. Okay, here's another question. I'm 33 years old. Almost six years ago, I donated one kidney to my mom. The surgeon did laparoscopy, but also did a mini laparotomy. So one big C-section cut in my bikini area. Could that have negatively impa impacted my fertility? Uh, you know what? Um, so I, to be honest with you, I'm not quite sure what the surgical field uh, it will involve, like uh, for uh, donating one kidney. Mm -hmm. But I think if the surgical field did not uh, involve the pelvis, mm -hmm. then the chance to have like a pelvic adhesion disease, um, like from those surgery, probably right. will be low. Super yeah. low. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I think we're almost done with questions. We have one uh, last question. Are you ready? Okay. Almost yeah. an hour of questions. I love this. You have to come back on. I don't know that we've gotten so many questions before. Okay. How effective is weekly acupuncture for IVF? How effective is it? Okay. Uh, you know, I think like, uh, uh, the, so when I um, saw the acupuncture in the U.S. and mm -hmm. acupuncture in China, uh -huh. it's actually uh, very different. So in China, when I had acupuncture, it's very intensive, like aggressive, let's say in that way. But I think yeah. in the U.S., most acupuncture treatment is uh, um, much, much like a, uh, gentle and yeah. soft. Um, yeah. I think it definitely can help some people to relax mm -hmm. and uh, to like uh, just uh, mentally feel better. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like how much like a uh, uh, help or an improvement uh, it can um, provide to your outcome, I think uh, it's really hard to say. But I think if you feel uh, acupuncture is helping you to relax or mentally like uh, uh, like making you feel like less stressed, I think it's definitely uh, go for it. I want to hear more about the more aggressive Chinese acupuncture. <laughs> they have so like very there... long needle and oh, just like seriously? going to your muscle and twist it. No. Oh, uh, yeah. Shut it's the door. A, seriously? Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Uh, I didn't and, know that. Is, are there any acupuncturists here to, to, to do it that way? The more uh, I, way? I, don't, I don't think so. I think no. like in the U.S., whatever, like so far what I uh, saw, um, I have been seeing is kind of like a much, much, uh, much gentler. Less, oh, yeah. yeah no, gentler. a lot of patients, they're going through enough of those shots. They don't need to have something piercing their exactly. muscle. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. <laughs> okay. Well, mm -hmm. last question. Okay. We're going to close it off after this. Um, I, I know. Ouch. Okay, I noticed I have blood clots during my period after an egg retrieval. Do you think that's a complication from the egg retrieval? Uh, I don't think so. Um, yeah. uh, well, I cannot say for sure, but uh, I mean, like uh, during the egg uh, retrieval or like a stimulation cycle, let's say your right. estrogen level is much higher than usual. So your yeah. endometrial lining will be much thicker. That yeah. can cause like heavier uh, uh, menses in that cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that's truly like the complication from the retrieval. I think it's just like uh, the effect of estrogen and then your next cycle when you go back to your normal natural cycle it right. will go back to your usual yeah. state yeah so what i tell patients is i just want you to know that your period after an egg retrieval could look like a murder scene does that sound bad that sounds really bad that sounds so bad 
but it's true. And right? it's true. It's like yeah. the heaviest, most painful period. But then I tell people, if you don't have that, it doesn't mean anything is wrong with you either. Like sometimes it's not horrible, but expect like the worst period of your life. Because if you don't tell people that, they freak out. They like go to the emergency room and they call 911 because they think that something happens to them and you cut them. And I'm like, Uh I didn't do anything. You know. I need to consult yeah. my patient and provide that information yeah. from that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not use the term murder scene. I'm sure there's something a little bit better than that. But after all, we use the word trigger shot every time when we talk about ovulation. So that's uh-huh. kind of silly. Oh, someone is saying I have endometriosis. So it's always like that. And I'm sorry. I'm going to do everything I can to help anyone out there who has endometriosis. So thank you. Okay. Mm-hmm. G, thank you for being yeah. on with me. I'm I, so, so I, fun to talk to you. I appreciate it. I'm so happy to be here with you. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, it's a yeah. Um, So every time, every time when I'm with you, I learn so much. Oh no, (laughs) we we yeah. So will you come back again? Can we do this again another Friday? Absolutely, I'll be very happy to do that. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, G. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. See you. Bye. Bye, Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us. See you soon. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye.